Genesis 25 in your Bibles today. I want to do a compare and contrast tonight on the inheritance of the believer. And we're going to see here two individuals who were given an inheritance in the Bible, and there were two responses to both inheritances. Looking at verse number 34 of Genesis chapter 25, and uh, <clears throat> we are going to start, 24, excuse me, verse number 24, the Bible says, And when her days were to be delivered, were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. This is now Rebecca, who the Bible is speaking of, Isaac and Rebecca. And the first came out red, all over, like a hairy garment, and they called his name Esau. Now, if I knew any of you personally, I would probably insert somebody's name here and say that this was probably their baby picture and, uh, and when they were first born. They were born hairy, amen? <laughs> but I don't know anybody quite like that yet, so uh, that'll be for another time, Amen. <laughs> See, if you haven't figured it out by now, I'm a teaser and a joker. And uh, I, I don't know, I just picked it up from the Tharp family. You can blame them for it. And uh, see, in my family, you, if, you can't, if you can't take teasing and ridicule from within your home, there's no way in the world you can take it without it. So uh, we beat each other up. <laughs> we, we impugn each other. We demean each other. But, uh, but we are resilient in the world. Amen. <laughs> But look at verse 26. And after that came his brother out, and his hand took hold on Esau's heel. And his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was threescore years old when she bare them. And the boys grew, and Esau was a cunning hunter, a man of the field, and Jacob was a plain man dwelling in tents. And Isaac loved Esau because he did eat of his venison. But Rebekah loved Jacob. What a horrible example of parenting! Horrible example. I think that goes without saying, don't have favorites in your home, parents. Don't have favorites. I know some of them might be easier to rear than others. Some of them might respond better, but you will raise a rebel if you do this. You will raise a rebel. You will raise a defiant boy or girl, and they'll, they'll learn to hate you for this. And uh, listen, to the, listen to the warnings of the Word of God, uh, and learn from the mistakes of other people. It's not what the message is about, but I just felt Lord led, Lord led to uh, in, in, uh, pu or plug that in for you. But uh, looking at verse number 29, And Jacob sawed pottage, and Esau came from the field, and he was faint. And Esau said to Jacob, Feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. And Jacob said, Sell me this day thy birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I am at the point to die. And what profit shall this birthright do to me? And Jacob said, Swear to me this day. And he swore unto him, and he sold his birthright unto Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and pottage of lentils, and he did eat and drink and rose up and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Now, an inheritance in the Bible had something of great significance. In fact, in the Bible, it teaches the, the fathers and the husbands to leave an inheritance to their children. In the Bible. Uh, I believe in the principle that you take care of your family. The Bible says if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. And God outlines in his word that you are to take care of your family even after your death. And this is why I personally, I have life insurance as a policy on my on, uh, on my life, and uh, because you know what, if, if I die, my wife becomes a rich widow, amen? <laughs> she hates when I say that, but, but you know, in, in, all, in all seriousness, the, so, that's something that is important, a birthright, an inheritance, and God it was, had always given the birthright, just because of the birth order, given it, given it to the eldest son. And I like that. Amen? I like that. Gabe, if you're watching, there you go. There's the Bible for you. I get mom and dad's house. <laughs> but here is the point. God gave the blessing, the birthright, to the eldest son. Esau was the eldest just by a few moments. But Jacob was the younger brother. But the Bible says that there was a situation that arose in Esau's life. He, he said, the Bible says that he was... He, he claimed he was nigh unto death because of weariness and he was out hunting and he was hungry and he needed substance. And 
Jacob used this opportunity. The word Jacob, the name Jacob means supplanter and deceiver. Used this opportunity to swindle the birthright from Esau. And an inheritance, it carried a great deal of weight. And tonight we're going to look at two men who had an inheritance. And we're going to look at their two very different viewpoints regarding their inheritance. These two men weren't really anyone of real prestige. They were just regular people. One lived a life for selfish gains, and the other lived a life seeing the bigger picture. So, number one, we're looking at Esau's inheritance, and it was his birthright. And a birthright represented a great deal of things. See, after the passing of Isaac, he would essentially become the head of the family. He would become the known patriarch of that family once Isaac, once Isaac would pass off the scene. And he would have the final say and authority in the family. He would have charge over all the family's property. He would have charge over all the possessions of the family, the servants that goes along with it. He would be responsible for his siblings, any widows, and any unmarried women in that household. So that goes to show you there was a great deal of responsibility when it came to the inheritance within the family. So I want you to understand this wasn't just something that Esau was giving up uh, money because he wasn't just giving up money. He wasn't just giving up land. He was giving up the right and the responsibility to take care of his family. Right. Big deal, isn't it? That's a big deal. I feel that there, the, I feel pr primarily in my life that nothing, other, aside from God, nothing is more important than my family. Amen. Even the church. Amen? Amen. Right. God instituted the institute of the family far before he did the church. Right. Right. But that doesn't mean that... Uh, you can just do away with church. You should have your family in order and have your business in, in order. And that's why as, as a pastor, God says to tell the pastor to have his family in order. And how can he rule the house of God, right? And so it's important to have your family in order. But finally, here's what the birthright would do between not just him and people around him, but him between God. He was put in a special standing in God's eyes. In the times of the Old Testament, God would usually deal directly with the head of the family or the household. He would directly deal. He wouldn't deal with his younger siblings for the most part. He would deal with the head of the household, deal with the patriarch of the home. If Isaac was off the scene, it would then become Esau. Now, I want you to see Esau's view of his birthright. In a moment of physical weakness, we see here in verse number 30, Esau said to Jacob, feed me, I pray thee, with that same red pottage, for I am faint. Therefore was his name called Edom. He had a moment of physical weakness. And Esau came to Jacob, willing to sell his birthright for a moment of a full stomach. How sad is that? Given all of the information I just gave to you about what the birthright meant and what it was signifying, he was willing to give up all of that, that responsibility and those rights and authority and power to give it up for a bowl of soup. What does that say, oh, his view of his birthright? That's, and I want you to understand, that wasn't just something that Isaac just made up. It was... From passed on from generation to generation to generation to generation. It was something that was carried on this birthright. And this wasn't just a, uh, uh, some, some, uh, some sort of, uh, uh, again, it wasn't, again, well, uh, his money. It, was, it had nothing to do with his inheritance and money. Had, had, it was completely put him with the responsibility to take care of his family the rest of it, and dealing with God one-on-one. -on -one. This birthright possessed a great deal of significance and would eventually be passed on to his oldest son. So I want you to see that this was not just going to be uh, the, it wouldn't just end with Esau because Esau then would grow old and he would die and then he would pass it on to his eldest son and would carry the legacy on. 
You, call, you follow what I'm saying here? You see the importance here? But the Bible says he sold his birthright and not just sold it, but look at verse 34. The Bible says he, what? He despised his birthright. He despised it. Now, when I say that word despised, that doesn't usually bring fuzzy feelings to my, to my soul. You know, when I say I despise something, I hate it. I despise cow tongue. Who in here eats cow tongue? What is wrong with you people? <laughs> All right, here's even one even worse. Chicken feet. Please tell me nobody eats chicken feet in here. Who, who eats chicken feet in here? I was going to say you're kicked out, but I can't do that to you, Brother June. I'm sorry. <laughs> I had some kids in my youth group back home that uh, were missionaries to China, and they would eat chicken feet like candy. I don't understand it, Brother June. What is so appealing about chicken feet? Do you know what those chicken walk in? Do you know? Do you understand what they do? Oh, I despise chicken feet. Brother Tudor, can I get an amen? Amen. I hate chicken feet. I despise it. The Bible says that Esau despised his birthright. The birthright didn't mean much to Esau. Because, and I want you to catch this now, it did not benefit him right here and right now. Too many Christians are sacrificing the things of the eternal on the altar of the present. I'll say that again. Too many Christians are sacrificing the things of the eternal on the altar of the present. Do you understand what that means? What we're saying is, is that it's not, con it's not convenient to get your family dressed and ready to go to church on Sunday morning. This is not convenient. Believe me. Talk to my wife on Sunday morning. <laughs> Four kids and packing up, letting two dogs out. I mean, it's not an easy task. Mom, say amen. <laughs> not an easy task. But nothing is more important. Nothing is better than making sure your family is reared in a godly church. Amen. Don't sacrifice. Listen, hey. Get your kids in church on Wednesday night. Amen. Get your kids, get your teenagers in church on Wednesday night. You know why? Because I, I don't care, listen, I don't care what sport practice is going on. I don't care what, what other event might be taking place. Nothing trumps the house of God. It shouldn't be, at least. Nothing trumps the house of God. Nothing trumps Sunday school. I'm sorry, a few extra hours of sleep is not more important than being in the Sunday school hour. Amen. Nothing is more important. I don't care how tired you are. Brother Michael asked me if I got rest this afternoon. I said, no, I didn't. I'm tired. That's why I'm going to cut it quit tonight. <laughs> but I said, hey, you know, even though I'm tired, I'm going to be in the house of God. Not because I have to preach, because I need to be here. And so does my family. But I'm not going to sacrifice the things of the eternal on the altar of the present. Esau did that. He sacrificed a legacy for lentils, for pottage. So what profit is there, he said. What profit, he said, what profit shall this birthright do to me? You see that here in verse number 32. Behold, I am at the point to die, and what profit shall this birthright do to me? His viewpoint was incredibly, Brother, Brother Matt, selfish and self-consuming and vain. Number one, what will it help me? How is it going to help me? What, hey, Mr. Esau, what about little Esau? What about grandbaby Esau? What about them? See, this is why, church, we have to hold to the values of the word of God and not sell them. The Bible talks about buy the truth and sell it not. Hey, listen. Listen. Those aren't things you can afford to sell because you may not get them back. Those are things that once you sell them, there's no refund policy. You see, Esau, he said, this isn't going to benefit me right here, right now. This is, this is not going to sustain me here and now, so I'm going to sell my birthright to satiate my selfish appetite. Little did he realize what he would have had at hand at the passing of his father. He had no concept, no idea what he was giving away. 
None. Because if he understood the weightiness, Brother Thomas, of what he was selling, he'd have said, you know what? On second thought, <laughs> forget that. I'd rather die. Yeah. I'd, rather, I'd rather die and give it off to my children one day instead of it being sold off for a, a bowl of red pottage. See, he saw no gain for the birthright, for the future, because he was living only for the present. And I know it's many times something that we are easily forgetful of. Because we are, we are born and raised and reared and taught to live in the present. We told that, we're told that throughout social media, through all the... Just live for the moment, right? Just live in the moment. Live in the moment. No. Live with the understanding of what is going to come down the pike. That's what we ought to be doing. And... This is why you ought to maintain godly characteristics in your home of <clears throat> being in your Bible together as a family, praying together, soul winning together. I understand it's not the easiest thing. Again, try going door knocking with four kids, one in a stroller and three, you know, telling them how thirsty they are and how hot they are, all right? Going up to a door. And you know what? I want my kids to understand the spiritual birthright that has been given me. I want them to see the weightiness, the importance of the birthright that has been given to me as a Christian. But someone, so, someone told me this one time. I'll read it for you. Something someone told me once is, if you have to make a decision now and right now, usually the answer should be no. If anything is worth making a decision over, it should take time to think about it. Now, let me give you an illustration. Anybody have True Green for their lawn care service? You get enough water in the world in here, you, you have no need for fertilizer. <laughs> but I used to sell lawn care service in True Green for True Green in West Chicago. And uh, I was dealing with, uh, in St. Charles, Brother, Brother Allen, St. Charles, Illinois, where all those ritzy guys, you know, all those CEOs of Microsoft and Apple, and they're flexing their Ferraris. And Actually, fun, true story, I got to drive a Ferrari, preacher. I got to drive a Ferrari. Now, granted, I only went like 15 miles an hour, but I got to drive a Ferrari. The guy said, he, I was knocking on his door, and I was playing the Bible college student card. I'm like, oh, I just need money to keep going for Bible college. He's like, well, I'm a Catholic. I'm like, oh, that's so great. I need you to, I need you. God's going to use you to bless me. I, I've, I've asked God for forgiveness after that. <laughs> for, <laughs> but <laughs> I know, I'm awful. <laughs> I shouldn't have got my diploma. Uh, but anyway, I told him, he said, yeah, I'll buy, just tell me, write on a piece of paper. I kid you not, he said, write on a piece of paper what you need to get your commission and I'll buy it. That's the kind of money this guy had. So I said, okay. So I'm writing down tree, shrub service, lawn pre preventative, uh, insect preventatives. But anyway, he said, let me show you how God's blessed me. I said, okay. So I walk inside his house, and there's a magnificent foyer. I'm going to use it that word because it's, it wasn't a foyer. It's a foyer, Mrs. Tudor. A foyer. There was a literal, I kid you not, a fountain in this guy's foyer. And then he said, take a look at the cabinets in my kitchen. <laughs> you would die over this house. He said, this wood came from South America and is some of the most rare wood you'll get your hands on. He said, each cabinet cost about $15,000. Each cabinet. I'm not lying to you, folks. He said, each cabinet cost $15,000. And the, the wall was lined of them, okay? And then he said, let me take you to my garage. He had a two, le Brother Mikhail, two-level garage. Two levels. The upper level was lined with Harley Davidsons. I'm talking about the electric glides, the whole, the whole gamut. The lower one, he had three, count them, one, two, three Ferraris of different colors. Same Ferrari, Brother Eric. And he said, and I said, why do you have three Ferraris? He says, I couldn't make up my mind which color to get. I said, wow, what a dilemma. What a dilemma. How could you do that? He said, pick one. I said, are you going to give it to me? Okay, Oprah, I'm ready, all right. He said, pick one. So I picked the red one, of course. And of course, you know, let's just get the attention of the cops, right? But he said, we're going to take a spin. 
And so I get ready to open the door, and the door, you know, like that. You know, I'm going to clap my head, you know, but... He said, no, you're going to drive. I said, bro, I'm not going to drive a Ferrari. He said, listen, I got more insurance on this thing than you realize. He said, just get in. He said, when's the next time you're going to drive a Ferrari? I said, never. <laughs> I told you, I have a Bible college student, all right? Uh, I, don't think, I won't even get a Ferrari in heaven, so he might as well get But anyway, I got to drive, and man, I was feeling like I was high on the hog. I was driving 15 mile an hour down a cul-de-sac, bro. But I, I was loving it. But you know, what the guy did... When I was selling him the service, he did the wrong thing. He said, name your price, I'll, sell, I'll, I'll buy it. And one of the things as a salesman that I would try to do, I would pressure people into making a decision right now. Make your decision right now. Don't think about it, just do it. Do it right now. Come on, no, no. What do you need to talk your wife for? Does she wear the pants in the house? Huh. I do, I'm in. I say, I, I'm sorry, uh, should I talk to her instead of you then? I, do, I, I mean, I got a lot of guys buy because of their ego. <laughs> but no, I'm, the, I'm the man in the house. Huh? <laughs> but the, the rule of thumb is this. Don't buy under pressure. And don't sell under pressure. Don't sell because you've got to do it right now. Hey, listen, when it comes to your job, your boss says, hey, you know, I'm going to give you a... Uh, Another, I'm going to give you a raise. I'm going to give you an opportunity. But, you know, you probably need to be, you'll be out of church two Sundays out of, out of the week or out of the month. You know, some people might say, well, that's two. Only two. But again, you don't understand. One of those two services might have been the Sunday that your kid got saved at church. I got saved on a Sunday night as a boy. Imagine if my parents thought it was important to take their family to church on Sunday night. Now, God would have inevitably saved me, I imagine. I, I, would have, I, was in, I was in church and preaching all the time. But you understand, what if your child was called to the mission field on a Wednesday night? Or, how do you know? You see, you can't afford to sell those things because you may not get them back. See, time, time revealed his foolishness. Looking ahead 50 years to the bestowment of the blessing, we see the recipient is not Esau, but is Jacob. Look at verse number 28 and 29. Uh, I turn my page here. Verses 28 or 29. And the Bible says, Therefore God give thee of the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of the corn and wine. Let the people serve thee and nations bow down to thee be Lord over thy brethren, and let thy mother's sons bow down to thee. Cursed be everyone that curseth thee, and blessed be that he that blesseth thee. See, this is a blessing that was not given to Esau. It was given to Jacob. Why? Because by right, Esau gave up. It was a contractual agreement. Esau gave up the birthright and sold it to Jacob. Esau heard the words of his father Isaac speaking to Jacob and responded in verse 34. Look at this, please. This is a, a real situation unfolding in real time here. Chapter 27, verse number 34. And when Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with a great, exceeding, bitter cry and said unto his father, Bless me, even me also, O my father, and he said, thy brother came with subtlety and hath taken away thy blessing. I disagree with that. What Isaac said. He didn't take anything. It was given to him. And he utilized what was given to him. See, Isaac, Isaac used this verbiage because, again, his favorite was Esau. And he portrayed his, his younger son to be a villain. Even though what he did was morally wrong... Both of them had a part in doing wrong. Both of them had a part in doing wrong. Verse number, 30, uh, verse number 36, And he said, Is not he rightly named Jacob? For he hath supplanted me these two times. He took away my birthright. And behold, now he hath taken away my blessing. And he said, Hast thou not reserved a blessing for me? And Isaac answered and said unto Esau, Behold, I have made him thy Lord. And all his brethren have I given to him for servants. And with corn and wine have I sustained him. And what shall I do now unto thee, my son? 
You know what he's saying? He says, I have nothing left to give you. I've given everything else to your brother. I got nothing left. Very sad, sad conversation. Verse 38. And Esau said to his father, Hast thou but one blessing, my father? He said, scrounge somewhere, please, God. Please, Father, find something to give me. Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. What a sad, sad occasion. Esau literally had an opportunity to be a, a, the patriarch of the family of Isaac, of Abraham. Was, he had that in his grasp. And then because of a moment of physical weakness, and can I say mental weakness, he gave up something he was never, ever, ever going to get back. Let's put this in our lap now, church. There are things in our life that we have that God has blessed us with that once we have them, we cannot, cannot let them go. One of those is your family, your kids. Daddy and mama, hold on to those precious babies like your life depends on it. They are your legacy. God forbid Years down the road, when you're dead and in heaven, your kids grow up and not know who God is because you sold your spiritual birthright. That's happened. Preacher, <laughs> it's happened. I mean, I'm talking about even preachers. Their kids, I'm thinking about one right now, in my mind right now, this man who's preaching today, currently, his children, he reared them, he, he sold some birthrights, they're not living for God right now, and their grandkids do not even go to church. I'm talking about this man preaches nationally. His grandkids do not go to church at all, and you know what? Chances are, when they grow up, their kids won't even know God. It's a digression. Somebody sold something there. Somebody gave up something they could not afford. The other thing is your testimony. That's another birthright that you have is your testimony. Because once you mar your testimony, you have a hard time cleaning it up. You have a hard time cleaning up. And these are things that you cannot afford to sell. These are things that, church, these are things that we must hold on to with all of our might. I'll pick, I'm going I'm to make this a part two next, next Sunday because I, I really, I don't want to rush through this. But I, I'm going I'm to finish with this point because next week we're going to look at Naboth. Naboth had an inheritance. I want you to see how he responded to his birthright. Many of you know the story of Naboth, but I'm going I'm to close it up right here because I, I feel like this is what God wants me to do. But can I challenge you, church? Just real talk here right now. Can I challenge you? Take an inventory of what is lacking in your Christian life. I can't see that for you. I'm not in your walls. I'm not, I'm not the fly on your wall that sees what's going on. But there is a sense of discernment that preachers get. When they are around people long enough, they says, oh, there's something not right there. There's something going on right there that's just not quite right. Something's going on. And listen, my challenge, my encouragement to you as your preacher, my encouragement to you is this. Understand the value of your birthright. Understand what you have in your possession. Esau didn't. Esau did not understand the weightiness of what he had going for him. He was so, too consumed and concerned about his own present being and concerned about his own vanities and selfishness that he sacrificed quite literally for the rest of for the all of eternity, sacrifice something that his children and his four and his great 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 grandchildren will never ever have anymore. Now, I want you to understand: God already ordained that Jacob was going to get the birthright. We see that in the Word of God. God said it was going to be given to Jacob, but I believe that God had a different plan for Esau. It wasn't just going to rob it from Esau and just render him victim a victim. God doesn't do that kind of stuff. 
But you see, Esau took matters into his own hands and it ruined his testimony, it ruined his life. And we see, even in the Bible, I, I, I want you to turn here one last time, the book of Hebrews. We're going to go back to the scripture next week. But I want you to see in the book of Hebrews. By the way, if you're not coming to church on Wednesday night, you're missing a good study on the book of Hebrews. Not because I'm preaching it, but because it's the word of God. Verse number 16 of chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 16. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person. You see him? As who? Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Keep reading here. For you know how that afterward he would have inherited the blessing. He was rejected. For he found no place of repentance. You know what that phrase means? It means he couldn't go back. Couldn't go back, couldn't change his mind, couldn't change the course of nature. Though he sought it carefully with tears. What a heartbreaking story. Heartbreaking. The fact that Esau changed his mind, but he couldn't change the course of events. And I'm telling you, parents, one day you'll, you're going to shed some tears for your kids. You're going to shed tears of joy because they're living for God and doing right, living by that blessed book, being faithful in church. They're rearing their kids to be in church. There'll be tears of joy. Amen? Those are good tears. Or there's tears of sorrow because you messed up. Because you, you created a cheapening of the birthright, of the spiritual inheritance. So tonight, I want to encourage you as we pick this up next week, I want you, I want you to think about what, what spiritual birthrights am I on the verge of selling? Is it your testimony at your workplace? Is it the fact that maybe you're just not being the level of Christian that you ought to be and it's going to spill over into your kids? You know, what the, the old saying is, is what the parents do, the children in, in, in moderation, the children do in excess. That goes both ways. You understand? Because if you're just the average Christian, at least they get an understanding of what Christianity is, and they might, catch, they might get the taste of it, and it, they might get addicted to it. They might love it. You know, my grandpa, <clears throat> my grandpa, who I revere still to this day, is, is my hero. And he's not known nationally. He's not... Uh, He's not somebody who you'll read in the sword of the Lord. But he was, a, he was a, 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 a flagship, in my mind, of spirituality. And you know what? I want to be a better Christian than him. Not because I desire some sort of accolade or praise. It's because I want to continue a godly legacy that only continues to grow. Because the natural tendency is to digress. Digression. We are prone to do worse because we have, Pastor Brandenburg's preaching on in his class, the flesh. We're prone to do less. We're prone to do the bare minimum because our flesh says, this isn't worth it. So let's not listen to the flesh. Esau did. Look what it got him. It got him nothing. Let's pray about this tonight, church. And if God spoke to your heart, listen, let's, let's not sell these things. We can't afford to sell them. They're too valuable. They're too precious. Let's honor the birthright. Would you bow your head? Would you close your eyes?